I could just get everyone's attention, please. All right, gonna attempt to try and stay on schedule. Um, my name is Amanda Howell. I'm a staff attorney at the Animal Legal Defense Fund, and I'm very honored to be here today moderating the panel, uh, Transforming Animal Status Through Civil Litigation. We will be hearing from three preeminent animal law attorneys that really need no introduction, but I'm gonna attempt to give a brief one anyways. Um, first, we'll have Matthew Liebman. He's the, <laughs> he's the director of litigation at ALDF. And as I'm sure you all know, Matthew's always been at the forefront of challenging ag-gag laws and has litigated and won the first uh, ag-gag case, ALDF v. Otter. Uh, Matthew is currently litigating Justice v. Vircher, which is a groundbreaking case on behalf of Justice, a horse that was horrifically uh, neglected. And that case, of course, seeks to establish that animals have a legal right to sue their abusers in court. Um, as a prominent and long-standing long animal law attorney, Matthew is on the edge of creative litigation, and he pairs his background in philosophy with his vast experience in the law. Uh, next, we'll have Kevin Schneider. He's the executive director of the Non-Human Rights Project, which was founded by Stephen Weiss, an organization whose work has focused on challenging the legal status of animals through litigation, legislation, and education. The Non-Human Rights Project's famous habeas corpus case in New York yielded maybe the most compelling concurring opinion I've ever read from Judge Eugene Fahey, who considered our relationship with all life around us and who ultimately concluded that of course, an animal is not merely a thing. Kevin oversees all aspects um, and assists in litigation of the Non-Human Rights Project and is a regular speaker and contributor to conferences, journals, and books. And we're very excited to have him here today. Uh, Delciana Winders is another attorney whose reputation far precedes her. Uh, Delciana leads Lewis and Clark's new animal law litigation clinic advocating for farmed animals through litigation aimed at expanding legal protections and rights for farmed animals. Before joining Lewis and Clark, Delciana was the Vice President and Deputy General Counsel for PETA, which of course has sought to establish fundamental rights for animals by suing SeaWorld on behalf of wild caught orcas for violations of the 13th Amendment and by bringing Sue on behalf of Naruto under intellectual property laws for his famous selfie. Uh, Delciana's work has appeared in countless law reviews and newspapers. Uh, her expertise is sought uh, across the country, and we're very lucky to have her here today. Please <laughs> jump together. Thanks, thanks for welcoming our panel. Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming. All right, thanks, Amanda, uh, and thanks to all of you for being here. Uh, I'm excited to uh, be on a panel with Kevin and Delcy. Delcy and I actually met at this conference 15 years ago, uh, back in 2004 when we were both second year law students. Uh, There's a student breakout session that we uh, hung out at and then got to be friends and have been uh, colleagues for the last 15 years. Um, so I do want to encourage everyone to take advantage of this conference, sort of get outside of your circle of friends, the people you came with, uh, and really get to know all the folks at this conference. They may be your comrades for, for decades to come. So with that, we're going to be talking about transforming animals' legal status through civil litigation. Uh, I'm going to be talking about uh, the justice, the horse case um, that I've been working on for uh, a little while now. So who is justice? The case is justice versus virtue, and justice, the plaintiff, uh, is a horse. Um, he was the victim of animal cruelty, but before I get into the, the details of that, um, I want to sort of talk about who justice is. I think there's an understandable tendency in the animal rights movement to uh, go first to animal suffering, to the things that they've been through. Um, but I want to talk about who justice is before I talk about what, what happened to him. Um, because I think this tendency to view animals merely as, as victims, um, as abject recipients of pity, um, overlooks uh, what I think came up on the panel this morning, which is their vast capacity for a whole range of emotion. So certainly animal suffering is central to the work that we do. It's something we have to reckon with, but it's not the whole picture. Um, and so if we focus exclusively on suffering, I think we erase the capacity of animals to experience the kind of joy that makes our lives and their lives meaningful. 
So um, let me tell you a little bit about Justice. Uh, I got to meet him back in September when I came out here for a hearing in the case, and he's a sweetheart. Um, he is his uh, guardian, Kim uh, Moseman at Sound Equine Options, that's the facility where he's at right now, um, describes him as curmudgeonly and a grumpy old man, um, which resonates with me. That's sort of my, my disposition. Um, but he's really funny. He's affectionate. Uh, you can see here that his eyes uh, carry a real depth that you can sort of look into these deep uh, black eyes and see a, a person there. Uh, he likes to eat carrots, as you can see from this picture. Um, he also likes to eat legal pads. He tried to <laughs> take a bite out of that notepad that I'm, I'm holding. Uh, by the way, that's my co-counsel, Sarah Hannigan, there in the picture. Um, he likes to play with other horses. His best friend is another horse named Badger, uh, who he shares a field with right now. But before Justice came to Sound Equine Options, um, he was... Uh, abandoned, essentially, in a barren field on, a, on uh, someone's property. Um, this is Justice when he was rescued um, from that property. He was the victim of animal neglect and cruelty at the hands of a woman named Gwen Vircher. Um, in March of 2017, Vircher's neighbor contacted Oregon Horse Rescue to express her concern about a neglected horse. Um, Oregon Horse Rescue then reached out to Sound Equine Options, who was able to convince Ms. Vircher to surrender justice to them. Um, they took justice to a veterinarian who evaluated him and um, found him to be 300 pounds underweight. You can see how skinny he is from this picture. Um, he had a body condition score uh, of one on uh, the, the scale of one to nine, um, indicating extreme emaciation. Um, here's another picture that sort of reflects um, how skinny he was at the time of his rescue versus how uh, healthy he's gotten to be now. Um, in addition to being malnourished and emaciated, let me apologize, this next picture is a little bit graphic. If, you wanna, um, if you're sensitive, you might avert your eyes. Uh, Justice also had a prolapsed penis. As a result of his malnutrition, he was not able to retract his penis into his sheath. Um, and as a result of that, his penis had become frostbitten, frostbitten from exposure in the Oregon winter um, from sub-freezing temperatures, and much of the tissue had become necrotic. Um, he also had skin conditions, including a bacterial infection called rain rot, um, and you can see, or see here how dull and sick his, his coat looks. Um, I'm happy to report that Justice is now thriving at Sound Equine Options. This is him now. Um, he's gained back his weight and recovered from his skin conditions. Um, his genitalia is doing better, um, although he does have permanent injuries. He also has psychological injuries and is sort of food, he guards his food a lot, which inhibits his ability to get along with other horses and undermines his ability to, to get adopted. So he's still. Um, uh, up for adoption at Sound Equine Options and maybe for a while given, given those complications. Um, let me show you a few more happy pictures of Justice. Um, this is, again, when I went to visit him. Um, and there he is trotting around in his field. So his former owner, Gwen Vircher, was criminally prosecuted, um, pled guilty to first degree animal neglect. Um, but her restitution order uh, applied only to the time before her plea um, and only amounted to about $3,000, which is not at all enough to cover um, the, the injuries that he suffered. So given that he did suffer serious injuries as a result of cruelty, who should have to pay for that care? Well, we think it should be his former owner, Gwendolyn Vircher. She's the one who subjected him to the kind of cruelty that has caused these permanent injuries. And of course, it's well established that victims of crimes have a right to sue their abusers in civil court for damages. And it's also well established, in Oregon at least, uh, that animals are properly considered the victims of crimes, thanks to the, the Nix case that Laura mentioned earlier. So we filed a lawsuit essentially combining those two principles. One, that animals are victims when they're subjected to cruelty and two, that victims of crime have a right to pursue civil damages, um, and filed this lawsuit on behalf of justice uh, against Vircher, premised on uh, the legal theory of negligence per se. Um, now, 
to give credit where credit is due, this is um, a theory that my esteemed co-panelist, Delcy Winders, came up with um, more than a decade ago. Um, you can see how old this memo is. Uh, from 2008, it's actually addressed to Pam Frosch back when she was still an ALDF employee. Um, and uh, ALDF had hired the firm that Delcy was working at, Meyer and Glitzenstein, to come up with uh, a legal theory that we could use to pursue animal personhood. Um, and Delcy came up with this idea of negligence per se that we'll talk about in a minute. Um, and I had actually just started a at ALDF um, uh, right before this memo was drafted. Joyce dropped it on my desk and said, let's, let's see what we can do with this. Um, so me and Delcy and a few other people kind of worked this idea up for a little while um, and tried to find the right venue, the right fact pattern, and it, it never quite materialized. Um, we just couldn't quite, um, you know, uh, uh, in the climate of animal law in 2008, it just, it wasn't ready yet. Um, but given all the developments in Oregon over the last decade or so um, that Laura talked about in her presentation, the Nix case, the Fessenden case, where Oregon courts have started to grapple with animals as being more than mere property, um, SB6 expanding to recognize animals as sentient beings, we started to see Oregon as a clear venue for, for, for finally testing out um, this, this legal theory. And so we fi ended up, once we found out about Justice's case, we decided it was time to finally test the theory. And the case was filed in May of 2018. So uh, what is negligence per se? It's essentially a civil cause of action or a theory of recovery in which uh, uh, it's a tort theory that uses statutory duties rather than a general duty of reasonableness to prove a negligence tort. So rather than showing that someone acted negligently by failing to, act, to, to exercise reasonable care, you're showing that they acted negligently by breaching a statutory duty, a statutory obligation like the one that's created by the animal cruelty law. Um, and the way that that gets articulated um, doesn't vary much from state to state. It's a common law theory, but it, it gets articulated a little bit differently um, in different states. But here's the test in Oregon. Um, so a plaintiff may state a claim for negligence per se by alleging that one, the defendant violated a statute, Two, the plaintiff was injured as a result of that violation. Three, uh, the plaintiff was a member of the class of persons meant to be protected by the statute. And four, uh, the injury that the plaintiff suffered is of a type that the statute was enacted to prevent. So let's sort of go through that test in Justice's case. Um, the defendant violated a statute, no question about that. There's an Oregon animal cruelty law that prohibited the way that Ms. Vercher treated Justice, she pled guilty, uh, so there's no question on, on prong one. Uh, justice was injured as a result of that violation, quite clearly. Um, three, Justice is a member of the class of persons meant to be protected by the statute. Well, there things get a little tricky. I'll tell you now, all the play in this case is around prong number three, so let's bracket that for a second. Four, the injury that he suffered is the type that the animal cruelty laws were enacted to prevent. Certainly, the point of the animal cruelty laws is to prevent animal suffering through malnutrition, through bodily injury, things like that. Um, so prong three, is justice a member of the class of persons for whose benefit the statute was enacted? Well, we know from the Nix case, um, which as Laura said, recognized animals as victims, and in that analysis, what the court was doing was saying, for whose benefit was, were the animal cruelty laws enacted? And for a long time, the original rationale for animal cruelty laws was the protection of property or the protection of public morals. And we heard this morning about the Kantian view of indirect duty towards animals, where uh, if we owe an obligation to animals, it's merely to protect human beings from the callousness um, or the exposure to sort of the unesthetic nature of, of cruelty. And so for a long time, it was about protecting property and it was about protecting public morals. But in Nix, the Oregon Supreme Court said, well, no, the principal purpose of adopting the anti-cruelty laws in Oregon was to prevent the suffering of animals. And although early uh, legislation may have been directed at protecting property and promoting public morality, Oregon's animal cruelty laws are rooted in a different legislative tradition of protecting individual animals themselves uh, from suffering. So we know that justice is within the class of, let's say, beings for whose benefit the law was Past. The next question then is, is he within the class of persons for whose benefit Oregon passed the, the anti-cruelty law? So that raises the question, is justice a person? And that's really what this entire case is about. Um, well, our argument is that 
um, a legal person is simply any, any entity with legally protected rights to whom others owe a duty of care. And animals fit that bill. The anti-cruelty laws create rights for animals. And this is the point that Angela was making this morning and one that we heartily agree with. Animal cruelty laws, uh, riddled as they may be with exceptions, difficulties though there may be with enforcement, nevertheless create both positive and negative rights for animals. Negative in the sense that they have immunities from being treated in certain ways. Justice had an immunity from being uh, neglected. Uh, animals have a right not to be treated cruelly. They also create positive rights, uh, that is an entitlement to something. So justice, by virtue of being the, the, within the custody of Ms. Vircher, had an entitlement to adequate food, water, and shelter. So the animal cruelty laws in Oregon created both positive rights for justice and negative rights for justice. Um, and correlative to those rights are duties upon humans. So we have a duty to refrain from treating animals cruelly, and we have a duty to affirmatively provide them with adequate care. So the animal cruelty laws create rights uh, and they create duties um, in animals. And as simple as that is, that makes animals legal persons. Animals are already legal persons because they are the recipients of rights to whom others owe a duty. Um, and let me just sort of put up a few uh, um, of the authorities we use for that position. So uh, Salmon writes, a person is any being whom the law regards as capable of rights or duties, whether human being or not. Um, Bryant Smith, to confer legal rights uh, or to impose legal duties is to confer legal personality. Uh, Nairi Nafin, where there is a legal right or duty recognized by criminal law, so there is a legal person, though if rights are few, the person is a weak one. Um, and Richard Turr, in a sense, the concept of legal personality is an empty slot that can be filled by anything that can have rights uh, or duties. Um, so our argument is that justice as a member of the class protected by Oregon's animal cruelty laws uh, is already a legal person. And I think one of the virtues of this argument is um, that it doesn't link animals' personhood to uh, anthropocentric standards such as their cognitive capacities. Um, a person can be any entity with legal rights, and that might be um, a horse like justice, it might be a chimpanzee, uh, it might be a chicken or a mouse. Um, so that's the theory of the case. Let me go through the procedural timeline here and just walk you through uh, how the case has progressed. We filed it in um, May of 2018. And I uh, want to give a shout out to uh, Matt Hamity, who worked on the complaint, and Sarah Hannikin, uh, who was also co-counsel on it. Um, in August of 2018, um, Vircher's attorney filed a motion to dismiss the case. And in September, we had an hour-long hearing on the motion to dismiss um, in front of pro tem judge John Knowles, um, who took the case seriously, had a lot of questions, um, I think it was a, 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 quite, good a quite good hearing. Uh, Kathy Hessler brought some of her students out to observe, um, but unfortunately we ended up losing. Uh, there was an uh, opinion letter issued in September of 2018 um, uh, saying that the case should be dismissed, essentially on four grounds that are all sort of versions of the same thing. Um, so what Judge Knoll said was first that justice as a horse lacks standing or legal status to pursue a, a case, so this is just the, the basic standing argument. Um, second is that he's not the real party in interest. Um, third is uh, concern about floodgates, that if we allow animals to sue for cruelty, that um, uh, there will be all kinds of claims that uh, would flood the courts. And fourth, that animals can't accept legal responsibilities. Um, it's really a fairly short page and a half um, decision, so not especially um, detailed on, on any of these things, but this is uh, essentially the, the, the reasoning. And then a few months later, entered an order and judgment actually dismissing the case. Uh, we filed a notice of appeal in January of this year and then filed our opening brief in July. Um, shout out to Chris Berry for doing a ton of work on that brief. Um, and then a week later, we got a couple of fantastic amicus briefs, um, the academics brief that Angela mentioned this morning, which she worked on with uh, Kathy and Justin Marceau, signed by quite a few people in this room, um, including uh, Delcy, um, Manisha Deca, um, Pam Frosch, uh, 
uh, Randall Abadi and, uh, and uh, a few other people who I might be forgetting, but um, excited to have that brief for essentially arguing the, the position that, that Angela argued this morning, which is that um, animals, by virtue of having um, uh, rights under the cruelty law, are already persons. So um, we also got a brief from horse experts talking about the kinds of entities that horses are and why they deserve the kinds of protections that this case seeks. And uh, I want to recognize uh, Lexi Monson, for, uh, one of our lit litigation fellows, for doing a lot of work to pull that brief together as well. Um, so Vircher's attorney filed an answering brief just a couple of weeks ago. Um, our reply brief is due in mid-December, December 16th, I believe, and then we expect to have oral argument sometime in 2020 and then a decision. So we are hopeful and optimistic that this is the kind of intuitive, modest, reasonable case that might finally uh, convince judges to recognize animals as uh, legal persons with enforceable legal rights. Thank you. So we've got a lot to uh, cover here, so I will just jump right in, because I know we want to leave as much time as possible for discussion. Um, I think I can speak for all of us when I say that's generally the more fun part, but um, my, my uh, goal here is to provide a brief overview of the work of the Non-Human Rights Project, of which I've been the executive director, sorry, I got cough drops in my mouth, of which I've been the executive director for the last four years, and uh, where I began uh, just prior to beginning law school as a volunteer about 10 years ago. So I've been, I've been working on this uh, with Stephen Wise and our team for the past 10 years. And uh, beginning five years ago, we filed the first common law habeas corpus petitions for non-human animals, beginning with chimpanzees in New York. And so I'm going to give an overview of where those cases have been, uh, where we've been in Connecticut, and also um, probably maybe most exciting, at least timely, uh, our case ongoing against the Bronx Zoo on behalf of Happy, an elephant, Asian elephant who's been there for over 40 years and who's spent the last 13 years alone. So, um, we were founded in 1996 by Stephen Wise and uh, we are the only civil rights organization working through litigation, legislation, and education to secure fundamental legal rights for non-human animals. And just like Matthew, we'll talk a lot about, a lot about this concept of legal person. Who is a person uh, and indeed why why does it matter? And uh, you'll see there, you know, the fundamental problem that we at the Non-Human Rights Project are out to attack is this categorical thinghood of every non-human animal, um, at least in the United States. And a bit later, I'll talk about some of the encouraging developments that are happening outside of the United States. So why legal personhood? Why, why do we have to go to this? I think it's common. Some people hear this for the first time, and they're like, well, do we, re do we really need to do that? Animals already have rights. Well, the fact is they don't and they can't because they're under our legal system, under the common law that forms the backdrop of our legal system, it's split into these very crude two categories and, and no one's here to defend that. We're just stating what it is and you can be a thing or you can be a person. And like uh, Matthew with those really helpful um, four uh, excerpts from you know, different uh, uh, treatises on the topic, you'll see that uh, while we have all kinds of connotations around the word person, uh, it's, it's a loaded term in so many ways. When you really get down to it in the, in the law, all that it means, a person is a, a vessel, a container, essentially, that can have rights, one or more rights or duties. Um, just really briefly, we had an interesting back and forth in one of our cases um, two years ago, two, three years ago, in which one of our researchers, Spencer Lowe, found, uh, discovered that Black's Law Dictionary actually had the wrong definition of person. In their 10th edition, they said that a legal person is blah, 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 the subject of rights and duties. So they essentially misquoted Salmond, which you saw uh, Matt just talked about. And we actually got uh, Brian Garner, the editor of the Law Review, uh, Black's Law Dictionary, to change the definition of person. So if you now look it up in the 11th edition, it actually is correct and it says rights or duties. And we'll get into why that is extremely important, I think, um, for all of us who are trying to expand personhood and rights to any non-human animal. So there are, uh, and here's a recent example from New York that I think really kind of encapsulates where we're at um, across the board. Judges really want to be able to do more for animals. I think we've all seen this in, um, in the better cases. 
uh, but they're constrained by the legal thinghood of animals. Uh, you'll see in this recent uh, county, uh, it was a custody dispute, uh, you know, the, the, ju the judge said, this court concludes that it is time to declare that a pet should no longer be considered personal property like a table or car. And the reason that he uh, reached this in this case, like any other time you're having a legal argument over uh, the interests of an animal, uh, and folks who have, have looked at custody will be familiar with this. In New York, there's been this battle over whether the best interest standard can ever be applied, because while some judges, it's intuitive, it's obvious, this cat, dog, is a member of the family and should be treated, you know, not like a table or car. There are other judges who say, well, wait, look, there's still things. How can we look at the best interest of a thing? So you see this growing tension, and I think a lot of it comes down to the fact that we have this common law. We're stuck with this, bu this crude binary. You can be a thing, you can be a person. Uh, when, when we all know in our own lives, and I think even more so with science and other developments, that that doesn't comport with how most of us see the real world but it is still the language of the law. So to go into our cases a little bit more about you know, how we structure the argument about how any animal can be a person, um, you know, there is really no formula for creating a legal person. I think that can come as a surprise to certainly non-lawyers, but even lawyers and judges. Um, this is the sort of thing that we really have not had to think about very deeply for hundreds of years, if in some ways ever. Um, the, the question of what makes a person. You know, you heard Matt uh, talk about some of the ways that we might get there. But for us, uh, at the Non-Human Rights Project, we have chosen to um, approach the question, at least from the onset, through the lens of autonomy. And we don't do that. I think there's a, a sort of a, a, a misapprehension that comes uh, with our work sometimes that we're somehow exalting human-like or really cognitively complex animals above all others, but that's really not the case. Our, our argument is that, look, you have a million species of animals, they're all gonna have very different interests, but we know that at least some of them scientifically, demonstrably are autonomous, and we'll talk a little bit more about what that means in this context. And that's significant not because we say it's significant, it's significant because there's hundreds of years of case law that protects autonomy, of course, it's been human autonomy up until now, but there's really no good in the argument for keeping it only human autonomy and ignoring the vast sea of non-human autonomy that we're only now becoming aware of. That, you know, that can't stand. We think that it's so uh, circular, it's so counter to what the law claims to care about, indeed, liberty, equality, autonomy, that it can't stand, right? We can't continue to have a legal system that relegates every single animal, non-human animal, to the status of a thing, uh, because it's, it's simply wrong. So what do we mean by autonomy here? A, an autonomous being is a being who can, a self-initiating being, who performs intentional, intentional, adequately informed actions, free of controlling influences. So in, in other words, it's, it's a being that's not cabined by instinct. It's not dictated to by its internal mechanism to act a certain way. And you know, it may be the case that Many more species are autonomous than we know, but for now, as science has the point that it's at now, um, the species that we know are autonomous, really beyond any real reasonable doubt, are both species of elephants, so African and Asian elephants, uh, the four species of great apes, uh, gorillas, orangutans, bonobos, and chimpanzees, uh, as well as cetaceans, dolphins and whales, but also it, it would appear African gray parrots and uh, possibly corvids, ravens and crows and other birds as well. But again, autonomy is not a, and here you see um, kind of an example of how seriously the common law treats autonomy. Uh, I think one of the best examples, and here's a case called River versus Cats, the, at least in New York, and this is really the prevailing law, that a human of sound mind can refuse life-saving treatment. And what we draw from that is the court saying that this notion of autonomy, of free will, of free choice, is more important even than the state's interest in keeping human beings alive. In other words, it's a really important thing. And so, um, oh, I'm jumping ahead here a little bit. But, so in our cases, we present scientific evidence that shows, again, beyond doubt that at least these species are autonomous. They have so much going on inside their heads that is so much 
like how we view the world, how we process the world. Uh, some of my kind of favorite um, examples of this or go-to examples with regard to chimpanzees, I think most folks are aware of that they can learn sign language and communicate in and transfer, transfer that to other members of their species without human intervention. And with elephants, the, they're, they're being documented coming back to the same patch of bones year after year of their relatives and picking them up and crying and standing in circles and clearly um, to any reasonable person I think has to say they're grieving uh, their dead relatives. Um, you know, it used to be the case that this would have been written off as pure anthropomorphism. You know, you're, you're reading human-like uh, emotions into these animals with no scientific basis. But thanks to the work of people like Jane Goodall and countless others, mostly women, uh, who said from the outset, wait, no, these animals are so much more than what they have been described as, you know, essentially things or automatons or, you know, like the Cartesian formulation that animals are really just machines, that there's not, nothing like the cognition that we humans have going on inside of them. But again, we now know that to be completely scientifically false. And so we too have run into, um, over the, the last five years, uh, the kind of, and I'm gonna summarize here, the main oppositions to, again, any animal having, being a person or having rights. Because while we bring these cases on behalf of one or two or three individuals, uh, at least so far in the habeas uh, cases, the judgments and the opinions that we get back, bro both negative and positive, speak much broader than, you know, simply the one or two uh, individual plaintiffs that are brought before the court, and we think that's important and significant. So you'll see here, and, and for some folks, I, I almost shudder that I have Richard Cupp's name on here, but I had to because he's really the sole support for the opinion that you see behind me that came about in one of our chimpanzee habeas cases in New York in 2014 which uh, led to an opinion where for the first time that we're aware of in Western history, although now you're seeing it, it's rearing its head in the, in the justice case and other cases as well, is this idea that in order to be a legal person, again, in order to be, have the capacity for any rights whatsoever, you have to be able to take on social duties and responsibilities. It's the idea of the social contract. And we've spent a lot of time, uh, including in several amicus briefs, really attacking that because it's not only an unsupported notion from history and kind of philosophical logic, but it's also a really dangerous one, not only for animals and other beings, but uh, for other humans, vulnerable humans as well, because it doesn't take a whole lot of thinking to realize that there are many human beings that don't fit this, and some who never will fit this definition, and yet we don't say that someone in a coma suddenly is a thing and doesn't have rights, or a child doesn't have rights because they can't take on duties. Uh, you know, that's just never the way uh, the law has judged who gets to be a person and who doesn't. And really, I think that in all of our, in every case that is starting to question this assumption, um, you know, we see this as obviously it's a frustrating thing that we have to deal with, a hurdle, but is, we think, really testament to the fact that the judges can't come up with anything much better. And this is, this is the juncture where we're at, right? The first time that people are really bringing these claims to the courts and forcing them to process these issues for the first time. And instead of getting really reasoned and careful, nuanced opinions, we've, we've so far seen things like this. But we're not really discouraged by that. You know, this is a problem, the legal thinghood of animals that's at least 2,000 years old, if not more. So the idea that it would just change overnight was never in anybody's mind, certainly not ours. Um, and so you'll see here, um, the argument, very similar, another case in New York, um, habeas uh, appellate decision that, that, uh, that turned us away. And you'll see they dropped any pretense of, of, you know, rights being a matter of duties and responsibilities. So in response to the argument that I just described, it's sometimes referred to as the argument for marginal cases, um, they just kick it back to this idea that, well, these are all members of the human moral community. But of course, the irony of that is that if you look at the state of the law over the last two or three hundred years, you'll see that for most of that time, most human beings were not treated as full persons under the law. And a lot of the civil rights struggles of the last centuries have been to actually expand and fully recognize every human group as being a person, of being capable of possessing a legal right. And 
Here in Connecticut, uh, I mentioned we've filed a habeas petition on behalf of three traveling uh, zoo elephants in 2017. Sadly, uh, two of them have died during the pendency of that case. Uh, we've tried to bring that to the attention of the courts and the urgency of it. Um, but so far, the uh, courts, in, including here the appellate court in Connecticut, the mid-level court, have really just doubled down on this idea that not only are duties and responsibilities in the social contract uh, a necessary predicate for any rights or personhood whatsoever, uh, but they say it in a, just the last line there, completely flat. No animal can have any legally protected interest that can be possibly affected. And so that for us is, again, not what we're set out to do when we file these cases, of course, like any of us, but we all, I think, are aware that, again, this is not going to change overnight, and we need to, in essence, really expose just how bad things are before people really understand. Because again, most people, you ask them, they think that animals have rights. They think that the social esteem, the fact that pets are part of the family, that that really transfers into them having rights, but sadly, so far, that has not been the case. And so for us, the idea goes from uh, simply relying on those kinds of arguments to really forcing the courts through the combination of an argument from autonomy, uh, various liberty, equality arguments, to say to the court, look, under the common law that you claim to uphold, you really have to recognize at least this non-human animal as a person because there really is no, and this is covered in a, a, f a philosopher's brief that was uh, quite influential in our New York cases and continues to be, uh, where in which 17 American, North American philosophers wrote a brief attacking this very, uh, this very question of, do you have to be able to take on duties and responsibilities in order to be a person? And they go into exquisite detail about just how dangerous and wrong that is. Um, just in short, the idea that the social contract is what creates persons rather than persons creating the social contract. And so to say that the social contract creates persons really takes all of our common law and flips it on its head in a way that we think is, again, not only legally untenable, you know, it has to fall, we think, of its own weight um, before too long, but it's also very dangerous for animals because as long as this remains the kind of de jure uh, go-to argument against animals being persons, I think all of us are going to be stuck in the same box. And so, briefly, um, the, uh, just uh, wrapping up the opposition to this idea, um, and we heard this uh, just this past Monday, we were in the Bronx arguing uh, for four plus hours in front of a trial court judge on our habeas petition for Happy the Elephant, and over our objections, she allowed arguments of uh, putative amicus filers, including Richard Cup and another consortium of uh, zoo and aquarium, uh, basically trade groups. And, um, and they actually argued that, you know, this slippery slope, that to extend rights to any animal, even a very intelligent, wild, captive animal like an elephant, would set in motion a chain of events that would essentially upend our society as we know it, which we think is a pretty crazy uh, response to the kinds of questions, what we think is a relatively narrow question that we're asking. And yet, again, this is the backdrop that we have to all deal with, the thing-person divide and the fact that all things, or all animals are things. And so our, our kind of real bright spot so far that um, mentioned before was this concurring opinion from Judge Fahey, who sits on the Court of Appeals, the highest court in New York. And I won't, uh, I think it was provided to you, so I won't go through it too closely. I wanna wrap up here. But he said some of the most remarkable things that certainly I've seen in a written opinion ever, including twice citing Tom Reagan, who we never cited, by the way, because we thought, hey, we're already asking for a chimp to be a person. We don't need to go citing Tom Reagan on top of it. <laughs> but he actually, or his clerk, or them together, um, you know, dug up these beautiful quotes. And while it's a concurring opinion that didn't give uh, the recognition of personhood yet, we think that this, and we hope that it's a, a bridge for others and our, ourselves to use to actually finally get there. Um, so, real quickly, and he concluded, again, with this right here, um, the issue whether a non-human animal has a fundamental right to liberty protected by the writ of habeas corpus is profound and far-reaching, and it speaks to the, our relationship to all the life around us, which, thanks, Judge, you're right, 
And he concludes with this beautiful but also confusing sentence, you know, there's no doubt that a chimpanzee is not merely a thing, she might be a person, so that begs the question, which one is she, Your Honor? You, right now, there's no third category, and we can talk about making one, but right now, this is what we got. Uh, so real briefly, um, I'll just, uh, I talked a little bit about this, and here's a, a timeline of our case uh, uh, with Happy. Some of the most exciting recent stuff was on September 23rd, that same judge, Justice Tewitt, in uh, the Bronx, gave us four hours. So she's now given us about 10 hours to argue on the record, and she's having us come back on January 6th. Uh, just a few weeks ago, I was able to get her to grant us a TRO, preventing the Bronx Zoo from moving Happy out of the state of New York, which they vigorously fought over, as you might imagine. And so right now, there is an elephant standing in the Bronx Zoo where she's been stuck on an acre for the last 40 years, who is very much a subject of an ongoing habeas petition, which we're hopeful will be the first time that we see this breakthrough and have a judge order her sent to a sanctuary. Because, you know, because she's so cognitively complex, she was stolen from the wild and her family when she was barely, you know, over a year old, she can't just go back. But we can do a lot better for her, and we can also um, set out a foundation for all of us to be able to uh, build on to see that the most number of species and animals that we can win personhood for, um, that we can do that. Uh, so real briefly, as I'll just finish with this, there are some positive signs. So uh, there have been a number of cases in Argentina, some of you may be familiar with. Uh, my favorite is the Cecilia case because it was the cleanest, a habeas petition was filed, she was declared a legal person and she now lives at a sanctuary in Brazil. And, um, and kind of my, one of my other favorites, you know, this is not restricted to the realm of animals. You're seeing uh, rivers and national parks being declared legal persons. That's, in essence, they can have rights and file lawsuits and be essentially parties in court. And uh, one of the most exciting ones was just last year, one of the high courts in Colombia declared that the Amazon rainforest is a legal person. To which I often say to people, if, if Jeff Bezos' Am Amazon gets to be a person, then the real one ought to damn well be one too. So uh, I, will, I will end with that. I know I went a little over, but thank you. Hi, everyone. So we've just heard some really amazing examples of civil litigation efforts based on common law or judge-made law um, causes of action. And I'm going to shift gears a little bit and talk about civil litigation under enacted law, specifically constitutional law and statutory law. And there are really good reasons for proceeding under common law. Um, judges have a lot of leeway to do things, but as Matthew has written about, we live in an era of judicial restraint, and we have seen that despite the freedom these judges have in theory, they tend to be pretty hesitant to flex their authority. I'm gonna focus on US cases only because that's my area of expertise, not because, as we just heard from Kevin, that's the only place these things are happening or should be. There's amazing stuff happening all over the world, and I think there's tremendous potential, particularly in countries with constitutions that are embodying, starting to recognize animals' interests at a constitutional level, and that's happening more and more. So I hope this will just be the beginning of a much broader discussion. So my plan is to talk about two vanguard cases brought under enacted law, and then talk about briefly about a couple other cases that aren't as sexy or high profile, but I think are really important, and then to share some thoughts and reflections and um, ideas about where we should be focusing our efforts going forward in terms of civil litigation on behalf of animals. So the first case I'd like to talk about involves telecom, and you can see kind of him in the outrageously tiny tank he was kept in at SeaWorld. This was the first ever constitutional claim brought on behalf of an animal in the United States, and it was brought on behalf of Tilikum as well as four other orcas, all of whom had been captured from their homes in the wild and then confined and exploited by SeaWorld. And this case was inspired by renowned Harvard Law professor and constitutional law scholar Lawrence Tribe, who gave a talk in response to Stephen Wise's first book, Rattling the Cage, that was then published in Lewis and Clark's Animal Law Review, titled, 10 Lessons Our Constitutional Experience Can Teach Us About the Puzzle of Animal Rights. 
And in that piece, Professor Tribe observed that constitutional law, quote, sometimes confers protections by identifying and prohibiting wrongs rather than by bestowing rights. And it can prohibit those wrongs in terms that are sweeping enough to provide a shield that is independent of who or what the immediate victim of the wrong happens to be. One of the specific examples he gave in this piece was the 13th Amendment, which provides that neither slavery nor involuntary servitude shall exist within the United States. As you can see here, there is an exception for folks who are imprisoned. I find that deeply problematic, um, in part because I have a brother who's in prison who works for about 30 cents an hour, but that's a conversation for another day. Um, the Constitution generally prescribes slavery and involuntary servitude in the United States as a per se wrong. That is regardless of who is being enslaved and who is doing the enslaving. And so eight years ago, this very day, actually, PETA, along with five other next friends, filed suit on behalf of Tilikum, Katina, Kasatka, Corky, and Ulysses. And the lawsuit detailed how these orcas were forcibly taken from their homes and their families in the wild, were trafficked, were shipped to the US, were sold off to SeaWorld, where they have been held in confinement, involuntarily forced to perform, and also subjected to things like forced semen collection, forced insemination for involuntary breeding. And the lawsuit argued that all of these conditions constitute slavery and involuntary servitude, there was a claim for each of those, in violation of the 13th Amendment. Now, did PETA think it was likely to win this lawsuit? No. But it was a possibility, and the risks were relatively low. Essentially, the status quo would remain the same. And even without winning in court, a lot could be accomplished. It could raise awareness about the shortcomings in our legal system as it exists today when it comes to the interests of these incredibly intelligent, complex, social, wide-ranging animals. And it could potentially lay the groundwork for future legal victories. And that's exactly what happened. Despite the broad language of the 13th Amendment, despite two centuries of US Supreme Court precedent recognizing that our Constitution is supposed to be interpreted <clears throat> in a way that reflects changing conditions and evolving norms, the court held that the 13th Amendment only applies to human beings. Nevertheless, the day the lawsuit was filed, the Associated Press ran an in-depth article about it which ran in hundreds of media outlets around the world. And that was just the beginning of the conversation. As you probably know, Tilikum went on to be featured in the game-changing documentary, Blackfish, and now conversations about orcas and their interests and what they are owed by the law are happening all over the world and changes are happening right before us now. So the next case I want to talk about is a little bit more recent and involve, involves this fellow. It was the first case asking a court to declare an animal to be the owner of intellectual property. This is Naruto. He's a criti critically endangered crested macaque. He lives on a reserve in Indonesia. And this is a self-portrait or a selfie that Naruto took. He lives next to a village. Um, that village is heavily populated by tourists, and he and his family go into the village to forage for food regularly. So they're very used to being around humans, and they're used to being around humans' reflective surfaces, things like rear view mirrors on cars and motorbikes. They're also used to seeing tourists taking photographs with the reflective lenses of cameras. Macaques are vision dominant, like us humans. They um, have grasping hands and opposable thumbs. And a nature photographer named David Slater wanted to get a full face portrait of one of these crested macaques. And he learned that they weren't going to go for it if he was behind the camera, because that was the equivalent of looking him straight in the face, something that he described as, quote, something that monkeys feel is bad manners. So instead, he set up a tripod with a camera on it and a cable release and the monkeys were, the macaques were interested. Eventually, Naruto approached the camera. He made a series of faces. He clicked the shutter again and again, and he took this incredible series of photographs. There's another one of them. <laughs> so despite it being 
undisputed, absolutely undisputed, that it was Naruto who took the photos, not David Slater. Mr. Slater went on to claim the copyright to the photographs and to sell them for profit, including in this book, which you can see here, which was published in the United States. Here's a page from inside the book, another one of the photos. <laughs> and the caption on this photo reads, a Sulawesi crested, crested black macaque pulls one of several funny faces during its own photo shoot seemingly aware of its own reflection in the lens. Despite the howling posture, the macaque was silent throughout, suggesting to me some form of fun and artistic experiment with its own appearance. A caption for another one of Naruto's photos in the book reads, quote, posing to take its own photograph, unworried by its own reflection, even smiling, surely a sign of self-awareness. Most notably, in the book, Slater said, quote, the recognition that animals have personality and should be granted rights to dignity and property would be a great thing. I agree, Mr. Slater. <laughs> but despite all of that, he went on to claim Naruto's self-portraits as his own and set out to profit off of them. The US Copyright Act provides that copyright in a work vests initially in the author or authors of the work. And although author isn't defined in the Copyright Act, the law is clear that the author of a photograph is the one who takes the photograph. It is not the one who owns the camera. It's not the one who set the camera up. In addition, the courts have recognized that Congress purposely left, left terms like author undefined to provide for flexibility. So the Copyright Act provides that the author of a work owns the rights to that work and also that they can sue for infringement of those rights. And so PETA, acting as next friends of Naruto and seemingly agreeing with Mr. Slater's views on what he should be entitled to, sued, alleging that Mr. Slater was infringing on Naruto's rights to the photographs that he himself had taken. And the relief that was sought in the lawsuit was simply that all proceeds from the photographs go to the benefit of Naruto and his family and his community, including the preservation of their habitat because they are, again, critically endangered macaques. As you may know, the case was not successful in the courts, and the judges, as we have seen all too often in cases under both common law and enacted law, fixated on the fact that Naruto was not a human being, despite, there was no, despite the fact that there was no such requirement on the face of the law and the plain language of the law. Despite the court's ruling against Naruto, PETA and Mr. Slater did settle the case, and Mr. Slater agreed to donate 25% of future revenues for the benefit of Naruto and other crested macaques in Indonesia. And then there was a snowball effect, with other wildlife photographers being inspired to donate portions of their profits as well to animal subjects, um, including a prominent BBC National Geographic photographer. The case also sparked massive international discussion, both in legal circus circles and far beyond legal circles, about what our legal obligations towards animals are and what they should be. And it may also be made into a movie now, I'm told. So as the common law cases that Matthew and Kevin talked about, um, as in those cases, these cases, the judges did not rule in favor of the animals, although there was clearly room for them to do so, for them to find that these animals were entitled to fundamental legal rights. But I think it's really important that we not be disheartened by these losses and continue pushing forward. I often bring to mind an attorney who argued groundbreaking civil rights cases in the Supreme Court in the 1960s and 1970s, actually started doing it right out of law school, Phil Hirschkopf, who went on to work with PETA and he would remind us of the old social justice adage, you lose, you lose, you lose, and then you win. And we're certainly never going to win if we don't try. So we need to keep bringing these cases, pushing for fundamental rights, and I think we need to keep doing it under both the common law and enacted law. But I think it's also important that we not put all our eggs in one basket, or I guess we're supposed to say all our berries in one bowl now. <laughs> um, Maybe someone can come up with something better than that, I don't know. Um, so sadly, as Kevin mentioned, a number of the elephants, uh, as well as the chimpanzees, on whose behalf um, the Non-Human Rights Project has sued, have passed away. Two of the five orcas, on whose behalf PETA sued in the SeaWorld matter, also died before we were able to get help for them. And 
Partly because of that, I want to talk about another category of cases, which aren't so focused on fundamentally altering the legal status of animals, but nevertheless have very real, tangible impacts for the status of individual animals and also for other animals who are similarly situated. So the first involves Joe, who you can see here. And Joe was used for the entertainment industry and then discarded at a decrepit roadside zoo in Mobile, Alabama. And he spent nearly two decades there, uh, completely alone, in a tiny barren cages. Visitor cage visitors were actually encouraged to throw peanuts at him. Uh, PETA filed a lawsuit on behalf of Joe under the Endangered Species Act, and after doing that, they were able to rehome him to save the chimps, which is an accredited sanctuary where he acclimated very quickly and is now in a large habitat and has numerous chimpanzee friends. And Joe is one of 10 solitary chimpanzees used for exhibition uh, whose PETA's legal team has been able to rescue in the last few years. And it's believed that there's just one more chimpanzee left in this condition. So hang on, Limbani, someone's coming for you. <laughs> uh, my next and last example is Ben. And Ben holds a special place in my heart I've spent time personally with him, both before he was rescued and after he was rescued. He was also the first of more than 100 captive wild animals who my team at the PETA Foundation rescued. He spent six long years at a roadside zoo in North Carolina. He was in basically a dog run, chain link, concrete floor. He spent most of his waking hours pacing back and forth. He was fed dog food on the same floor he was, had to urinate and defecate on. And PETA and the Animal Legal Defense Fund partnered with two local citizens to sue on Ben's behalf under a unique and wonderful North Carolina law that allows um, any person to sue to enforce the cruelty law. And that case was successful. And like Joe, Ben was moved to an accredited sanctuary where he's thriving despite everything that he'd been through. This North Carolina law has also been used to rescue other bears, and ALDF used it to rescue more than 300 dogs, which is incredible. So these are animals who, through civil litigation, were given a 180 degree change in their lives and have had very real legal protections recognized, despite the fact that they are still legally property. And I think it's important to mention these cases because they're just a few examples. They are just a few examples. There are many other examples. But I want to underscore that there is not one silver bullet that is going to get us to where we should be in terms of recognizing animals' interests under the law. It is going to take a multi-pronged approach. That approach is necessarily going to need to be flexible, context-specific, and creative, and we need to use all of the tools that we have. And this means continuing to push the cases that we focused on today for fundamental legal rights under common law, constitutional law, statutory law, but it also means bringing the cases that aren't as sexy, aren't as hope high profile, maybe as straightforward, seemingly straightforward as the custody case that Kevin mentioned, a dangerous dog case. Um, these can really help animals. And I think this is especially true for animals whose interests are particularly neglected in the law today, animals like farmed animals. We may not secure fundamental rights for these animals tomorrow, but there is a lot that we can accomplish for them through civil litigation, and I hope you'll stay tuned to the work of the Animal Law Litigation Clinic for that. But you don't have to be at a law school, and you don't have to be with a major organization in order to do this work. There are myriad opportunities to help chip away at the disenfranchisement of animals through civil litigation, and I hope that you will join us. Thank you, and that's... Olivia and Dodger, who inspire my work. Um, might be a little redundant, but I would like you guys to join me again in thanking all of our panelists for sharing their depth of knowledge. And then, because I agree, and I think Matthew and Delcy agree with Kevin, that the real fun is this part where we open it up for questions from you all. I believe that there's a, a microphone up here and one in the back. Or, or in a, and another one up here. So um, feel free to come up and uh, ask questions that I'm sure you guys are itching to ask. No, no one yet? Okay. Well, then, uh, oh, I think we've got. <laughs> okay. Um, I think we've. Uh, 
Perfect, thanks. Uh, go ahead. Hi, thank you. Um, I'm Sharon, hi. Um, so first of all, thank you. I mean, all three of you just do these amazing things that I think we all agree keep us going even when uh, the days when we, we feel like, you know, what, are, what difference are we making? And then we think about you guys and it's huge. Um, so I have two questions. One will be for Delcy and then one will be for you two guys. Um, Delcy, the two things, the two things, the Naruto and the, uh, and the Tilikum cases. The Tilikum with the 13th Amendment specifically, well, I thought that was genius because the 13th Amendment doesn't mention person. So it's almost like a, a precursor to everything we're talking about, about changing, shifting their status, because people started talking about uh, the 13th Amendment being about slavery and involuntary servitude without that trigger person thing coming up. And so they're talking about all of a sudden these animals and expectations about what is humane and not humane without that trigger there. So now that we've kind of moved forward, I'm wondering if you think that we could use the 13th Amendment again uh, not so much as a precursor, but as complementary, still ongoing, if that would be a potential to use for future litigation and discussion. Um, with Naruto, I'm wondering more from like the, the steps in putting together a thing. Um, was there a document that he understood that by clicking the shutter, it would, re it would produce an image, and then a second step where there was proof of that self-awareness that, oh, and that's me in that image because it seems to me if we wanted to use the selfie again as an issue, like we could, we could maybe work it that way. So that's your question. The one I have for you guys is both about using the legal framework of the social contract. Um, and uh, Matthew didn't talk about it so much, but like the climate change case that now LDF has against the government. Um, using that framework for social contract, I'm wondering if um, when we start talking about our expectations where we have a social contract as people um, and start talking about, um, Kevin, you had like one slide that went by really quickly with a quotation about natural resources not being something for us so solely to use but to preserve. I'm wondering if both of you guys could talk maybe a little bit about that as a future legal framework for us to kind of shift that thinking from natural resources and what are we getting out of it, especially the administration right now seems to be trying to talk more about using those natural resources and how we might actually start um, putting that in our own conversations we have with people to put that thought, to plant that seed a little bit more. So that's it, thanks. All right, there's a lot there. I'll, I'll try and tackle it and not take too much time. So on the, the question about the 13th Amendment um, and that Lawrence Tribe gets full credit for that. And I did mean to mention that my colleague, former colleague at the PETA Foundation, Gabe Walters, gets credit for uh, the Naruto case and identifying that cause of action. Um, Tribe, um, it, it is brilliant. And he did observe some other constitutional provisions that may provide avenues that w as well that are similarly strict prohibitions. The Eighth Amendment, the prohibition on cruel and unusual punishment is an interesting one that I've thought about. And, Yes, I do think there's potential there, but I also think we're, we're engaged in the work of getting judges to be willing to get there, and it's just gonna take continual pushing to do that, because as we saw, even though there is no reference to person in, in the constitutional language, the court still said that they're not a human being. So a lot of times in these cases, we see judges saying, well, this has never been done before, therefore it can't be done, which of course is not how things work, but we've seen in other social justice movements, you need to keep fighting and pushing against that. So yes, I think we will see it litigated again in the future. Um, on the question about whether there was a record on, on whether Naruto was actually aware that he was taking the photos, neither of the parties really disputed it. There seemed to be quite a bit of evidence that he was aware of it, but the fact is that the court dismissed the case at the 12B6 stage on a motion to dismiss. So there was never a chance to develop a record on that, never a chance to even delve into that issue. And that's one of the things that we also see happening again and again in these cases. So the courts are, are dismissing them very early on at the procedural stages on around these notions of them just simply not being human beings. And we're never even getting the opportunity to build records yet, yet. Change may be very soon on the horizon. Um, sure, yeah, so I mean on the social contract it doesn't play a big 
role in our theory. And in fact, I think the, the concept itself is pretty problematic for animals. I think this idea that governance is these autonomous individuals who come together to agree to be governed is uh, sort of rooted in a Western humanist political theory that I think is pretty damning to animals and to other vulnerable populations for that matter. So I think um, a lot of the, the theory that's coming out around vulnerability as a basis for political theory to me makes a lot more sense that, that you don't opt in to being governed. We're all born into this enmeshed uh, milieu in which we have relationships with everybody. Uh, nobody is truly autonomous. You, you can't sort of opt in to participating in society. You're, you're born into it and we have to figure out ways to protect the vulnerable, whether they're capable of opting into a social contract or not, to me seems to be the better political theory. But in terms of like practical litigation, it's not a concept that we, that we work with. Yeah, and, and like, we, like I said, you know, it, it hit us out of uh, left field. You know, we didn't expect it at all in 2014 and in fact, I would echo what, you know, what Matt said, it's, it's not something we would try to affirmatively, be, affirmatively build on. In fact, we're trying to repudiate it uh, because, again, it, it has never been the basis for rights and it's really, it's a, a, a philosophically, you know, robust sounding but really not way of just closing the door to all animals. And that's really what they're trying to use it for. However, um, if we're talking about, you mentioned the other thing about um, natural resources and Really, that was Judge Fahey repudiating the social contract and saying, look, that's not, we don't determine whether or not you can have rights based on this arbitrary, you know, social contract, but rather, um, it's, he took more of a natural law approach. Who are these animals? What are they made up of? What does science tell us about who they are? And indeed, per, you know, proceeding from that basis. And, and for me, it's, it's, uh, it's kind of, has echoes of this larger showdown that we see in other cases in the Supreme Court, for example, over uh, positive law versus natural law. You know, it, it sort of echoes what we see in common law versus statute, but it really runs deeper than that because, again, we're trying to not just um, take kind of problematic human rights things and, and associations and principles from the past and simply apply them to animals, but rather uh, kind of dig out our own basement, as it were, and kind of make sense of our own concept of rights and persons because what we've seen in our work, and I think maybe uh, a lot of folks can attest to this, is by asking whether an animal, any animal, can have a right, you can sort of throw the legal system into like hysterics. And I think that shows that, like Joyce talked about yesterday, this moral schizophrenia that we have about animals. And, you know, the law alone is not going to fix that, but it is obviously a critical part of it. I just, briefly, if there are any students looking for note or paper topics, I think taking up this social contract issue would be a really good one, because it's such a specious argument, but it would be nice to have something to cite to in, in grappling with it, because we're going to have to keep grappling with it, I think, for a while. We have this philosopher's brief. That is something that actually, I think, please, yeah. you know, yeah. if, it, if it's helpful, <laughs> talk to us. Thank you, guys. I think we have another question over here. Yeah, um, I, when I was elected, I was elected in 2000, and probably most of you know that Bridgeport is actually the home to Ringling Brothers. The first, one of the first bills I introduced was banning the bullhook. And when I introduced that bill in 2002, we got over 12,000 emails from around the world which shut down the computer system in the Capitol at Hartford. Do you think that didn't get a little attention to me? Think again. They were like, Diana, exactly what are you doing? gave a press conference on this, and Mr. Comerford showed up and started yelling at me in the middle of a press conference in the capital of the state of Connecticut that I was an idiot, that I didn't know what I was talking about. The Capitol Police came and dragged him away. Yes, and I was fighting this one all the way along with you guys. And what I really want to say here to you is what the work you're doing is amazing. But I want to say to you all here, I don't see other legislators here, and I'm telling you this is a winning issue. I run unopposed for probably almost all of my nine terms, and I ran unopposed because I scared the hell out of people, because I wasn't afraid to stand up and tell them what was right. And you can get legislators to do this because legislators care about getting reelected. Unfortunately, it's, it's bad that they do, because the minute you care about it, you lose your, all your power. I never cared about getting reelected. There were a thousand things I could do. But if you give them this issue, you guys, 
and I'm happy to work with anybody about how to get legislators to understand it's a winning issue. And that's what I have to say, because you know what? I want to get Comerford. I want that final elephant to have a home. Yep. Because if he thinks he can yell at me like he did, so he's got another yeah. thing coming. I thank you so much. I yeah. thank you for And I have to say, I, um, uh, this past week, uh, along with ALDF and lots of other great groups, I was in uh, my home state, uh, Massachusetts, in Boston at the State House, where they're considering a bill that would ban traveling performing shows with big cats, elephants, bears, uh, primates. And who showed up at the hearing but Tim Comerford. And we were talking about Beulah, the elephant who just dropped dead in Massachusetts in front of hundreds of fairgoers. And he had the nerve to say that, he was, that she was part of his family. And so, you know, we often see this, uh, this kind of, um, this, this, this comeback of, you know, their family, we love them. And we don't even get into that. You know, we say, we throw our hands up and say, even though we know that's not true, it doesn't matter if you love them, you shouldn't be able to own them. And I think you're absolutely right. You know, we've seen a number of, and I think all of us, we're seeing more legislative uh, interest um, ourselves in Connecticut. So we've had a couple of state reps who have expressed interest in trying to get them shut down and uh, some federal representatives as well. So uh, we'd, I'd love to talk about any advice you might have on that. I think if we're quick, we can squeeze in one more question. So. Okay, I'll, I'll, hopefully it's quick. So um, I, I'm just curious how the law deals with um, basically your authority to represent these animals. And for example, you know, I assume that there's not an attorney-client agreement with them and that, um, you know, how, do you, how, how can you say whether Naruto uh, cares about his copyrights or not? And <coughs> how, how is that addressed in the, in the law in these cases? So our legal ethics rules don't address these issues at all. Um, they're very focused on human-animal interactions. And then in terms of our legal procedural rules, in terms of being able to be a next friend for an animal or other avenues in, they're also not tailored to animals. So they're part of what needs to change, and they're part of what has posed some of the hurdles that we faced in these cases. So they're one piece of the puzzle that's outdated. Yeah, I'll say one, I think one of the, the good points about Justice's case is that he has someone who has displayed care for him. There's someone who has constructive custody of him and has acted on his behalf, and that's Kim Moseman at Sound Equine Options. And so we actually do have a representation agreement with Justice that is executed through, his, through Kim through, as his guardian. Um, so it's the same as if you were representing another client who didn't have capacity um, but was nevertheless had a legal right to be protected. So we, we, we do have a, a, an attorney-client relationship but, with justice through his guardian. But you also have opposing counsel vigorously arguing that you're, because he's not a human, you procedurally can't do that. <laughs> right, and we face the same thing. And one of the, in, in Connecticut, it's kind of come back uh, to be more of a challenge. But in New York, this issue of standing, well, which you're talking about, uh, because it's a habeas corpus case, Yes, it's so ancient, it really predates our modern notions of standing in so many ways. So if you get a judge who, can, who will say that this animal could be a person, at that point you've already, you've already gone over the standing hurdle because the question of, if, of a person being confined, that's it. You know, black, habeas is pretty black and white. Are you, cont are you detaining an individual, a person against their will or not? Um, if the judge is not willing to take that leap, you're not going to get to it. But if they are, then you've suddenly cut through this whole maze of procedural mess of standing. And in terms of, well, yeah, the, you know, the Bronx Zoo, for example, said they posed the question to us, did Happy ask you to represent her? Well, of course not. But does Happy exhibit that she wants to get the hell out of where she is? Absolutely. <laughs> and that's what we think is important. Um, I do see that there are additional questions. I'm sure that our panelists would love to speak to you all. Um, later on in the conference and after this panel, but unfortunately we're out of time. Please join me again in thanking Matthew, Kevin, and Joshua.